All right, let's get this show on the road. Hello, everyone. Hope you're well. Welcome to another edition of Math 1206. Um, let's just uh, jump into it. Uh, ba -ba -ba, where are we? Yes. Um, we have... Uh, we had our test, which ended yesterday. I don't know how anyone did because I haven't <laughs> started grading them yet. Um, once the week starts, I get like really busy, so I probably won't even start grading them. Maybe I can start grading them earlier, but I wouldn't count on it until like Thursday night after class. Let's be real, I'm not gonna do anything Thursday night after class. Uh, so maybe like Friday, <laughs> I'll start grading them. Um, they're actually, the class is actually pretty small. So it's possible that I can finish everything on Friday, but I'm not gonna like promise that. So maybe like Saturday, Sunday, I'll have the grades out. Um, when I do put the grades out, uh, you, you will get to review your test. You'll see what scores you got for each problem and why. And if you thought think I missed something, uh, there will be a regrade request button. Um, I think it's in the bottom right corner of the screen. So when you view your test on Gradescope, you think I made a mistake or something, you can click, oh, regrade request. Oh, Javon, I think you missed what I said here, blah, 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 whatever. So uh, if you want to actually challenge any grade, that's the best way to do it. Not through email, just through Gradescope itself. Um, but yeah, hopefully the test wasn't that bad. And um, I wouldn't expect uh, the grades before the end of this week, really. Um, other than that, uh, I think we're in the, yeah, I mean, we kind of wrapped up implicit differentiation, but the other stuff I will be doing is going to involve implicit differentiation. So I don't really want to say we we're done with implicit differentiation, but officially we're kind of done. Um, but it is a technique that we will be using continually. Um, a lot of it uh, to figure out formulas and do stuff with it. Um, so last time we went over derivative rules, existence of the derivative and implicit differentiation. So I mentioned, and there was a problem like this on the test. Hopefully everyone did it the easy way, like LN of some crazy stuff. And you are supposed to apply the log rules first. And it's actually a pretty easy problem after you do that. Um, we did some other examples here. I had an example like this. I don't remember if I left it on the test or not. I probably took it off, but it, it was something that looked crazy, but it was just a constant. And so the answer would just be zero. I don't remember if I left it. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. I, I, was, I was on the fence about whether I would do it because on one hand, it's like too easy. Like if, if you saw it, it would just be too easy. I didn't want to, whatever. So I did, <laughs> I, uh, I don't know if I left it on actually. Uh, we did some examples with trig. Um, this example led us into a discussion about the existence of the derivative. We know that the derivative does not exist where we have sharp corners. It does not exist where a function is discontinuous. It does not exist at points where a function has a vertical tangent line. That's when it, it's very steep at one point and then goes off the other direction. Um, and it's like, it goes like vertical for like a single point because if a function goes vertical for more than a single point, it's no longer a function. Um, so yeah, these three behaviors uh, cover cases where a derivative does not exist, and we spoke about that. Um, then we looked at implicit differentiation. This is just differentiation when uh, our x's and y's are kind of mixed together. You don't have like y equals f of x, like your x's and y's are all jumbled together, but you still want to do something like find dy dx or compute y prime. Um, and there's a way to do that, and it's the chain rule. Pretty much, uh, you differentiate as usual, obey all regular derivative rules, except whenever you differentiate someone who is not the independent variable, you have to multiply by their prime because of the chain rule. So if you differentiate a dependent variable, you multiply by prime. Uh, so in this case, um, because I asked for dy dx, I know x was the independent variable and y was the dependent variable. And these are the only two variables that were there, which means if I differentiate an x, I don't really have to do anything extra. If I differentiated a y though, I had to multiply by y prime. 
because I think of my y as an inside function. My y is really some function of x that I don't really know what it is. Um, but uh, I can just write the prime. And we did a bunch of examples like that. Um, we spoke about uh, how the answer to an implicit derivative differentiation problem, even though it includes y's in it, like the dependent variable, it can still be useful because we can do things like construct tangent lines and we can learn about functions by doing that. In fact, I think today we're going to have another use of tangent lines. I, would I get that far? Hmm. I don't know. I don't know if I'll get that far. It's like, it would like be the last topic that I would do today if I was like super optimistic, but I think we'll probably end today on the topic before that. Anyway, <laughs> uh, we will see more about using tangent lines to get stuff done later, but uh, that was pretty much all we did. We just did a bunch of examples. So there you have it, that's the recap. Um, let's get into it. So what we want to do today, I want to talk about a different differentiation technique. Um, so we're not gonna learn any new rules or anything, but we're going to learn like a, a method to make differentiating certain functions easier. Um, and whether it's implicit or explicit, it's not going to matter. You can use this technique either way. And I'm going to give you the technique. We're going to talk about it. And I will even talk about a variation on the technique, which, um, I think is really nice. And personally, it's the, the, what I use, but to kind of explain that I do need to talk about, you know, this technique, uh, on its own first. So uh, let me try to get some space here. I move stuff on my desk. Like, I feel like I have less space here than I normally do. Yeah, so I have to stay in a certain position because, uh, you know, Apple and their power cords, they give you very short power cords and you have to like purchase longer ones. So now I'm kind of stuck where the uh, the outlet is. So I can't really stray too far on my desk to get the longer cord. Anyway, um, back on topic. Let's say, okay, so I did this last time. I think it's already there. Okay, the topic I wanna to talk about is logarithmic differentiation. I don't know if that's straight or not, but uh, we will take it. Um, logarithmic differentiation. Um, let's see a motivating example. Um, compute uh, d uh, dx of x to the x, okay? So that's our starting example. And at first, if you're not paying attention, you might think that this is something that we know how to do with pretty easy. Like, what, Jamar, what are you talking about? Like, this is super easy. Um, you just move the x down and subtract one from the power, right? Uh, it's a power rule thing. And that would be incorrect. That's not the answer. And then you're like, oh yeah, there's an X in the power. So it's like, uh, it's like A to the X LNA years, right? So it's like X to the X LN X. Um, that would also be incorrect. So um, it's not as simple as it might seem. Um, so I want you to note uh, the power rule, which is to say D DX of X to the N uh, equals n x to the n minus one does not apply. Um, why? Because the power needs to be a constant for that to apply. And the power here, as you can see, is not a constant. Um, the power is x. Um, also, you can note um, 
the exponential rule, the one that goes uh, a to the x is a to the x ln a also does not apply. Um, for a similar reason, there should be a constant in a position where there isn't a constant. The base needs to be a constant. And so here you kind of realize that you're not in any position to use any of the rules that we've had before. Um, so how do we actually deal with this guy x to the x? So there is a general theme, uh, which I have mentioned in this class before. Um, one of the things that makes this complicated specifically is that power x here. Like if that power was like a number, um, everything would be fine, but it's not a number. And as I mentioned, whenever you have an exponential and you kind of, it's giving you trouble and you kind of want to get rid of it, you use logarithms, right? So that's a general theme. You have an exponential you don't like, use a logarithm. Um, so that's how log differentiation comes into play. So uh, here's, how, here's how we'll do this. Um, set y equals x to the x. And clearly we want y prime, right? So all I have to do is find y prime here. So what I can do is I can log both sides to get rid of that exponential. Um, now, I don't just want to log one side because that would be changing the equation. So I also have to log the side with the y. All right, so that's uh, log both sides. And now what I can do is I can do implicit differentiation on this equation. So, um, differentiate implicitly. So we use implicit differentiation here. Uh, so because the y is not a fun is a function of x, there's an inside function. So it's going to be like one over y times y prime. Uh, now for the, oh, I didn't do the most important part. Jumping ahead of myself here. What I want to do is I want to actually use the log to my advantage, uh, simplify. Uh, the right side. So notice what I have now is I can actually take this power and move it down in front, right? Because that's a that's a log rule. I can do that. And now x l and x is something I do know how to differentiate. That's just a product rule, right? So you have two functions here. We can just apply the product rule. Um, so I differentiate one, leave the second, plus leave the first, differentiate the second. And so that's just ln x plus one. And here I have one over y, y prime, or y prime over y. Now I do wanna solve for y prime. So what I can do is uh, multiply both sides by y. And that's our answer. But we do know what y is. y is x to the x. And so you get that your y prime is x to the x times ln x plus 1. And that gives you um, that the derivative of x to the x is x to the x ln x plus one, where of course the, the x is inside the log here and the plus one is separate. Um, you could also do one plus ln x to avoid confusion, um, but that would be the answer. Now this technique that I just did um, is called logarithmic differentiation because I used a logarithm to simplify things before 
I actually took the derivative. Um, are there any questions on this, on what I did? Okay, so that is a uh, logarithmic differentiation, essentially. So we can actually use the logarithm to make our lives easier, even if there wasn't a logarithm there in the first place. We can just take the log of both sides of an equation. We can use the log properties to simplify because they're nice properties. Um, and then we can actually differentiate a lot easier. And we can figure out derivatives that we don't uh, actually know. So let me describe the process here. Uh, so, so here's what we're, we have, uh, if we have, um, say, y equals f of x, um, where f of x is greater than zero, uh, we may find y prime equals dy dx by doing the following. Uh, one, log both sides of the equation So that was the first step, log both sides. Um, so here uh, you would get uh, ln of y equals ln of f. The second thing you would do is uh, simplify the right side. Uh, using log properties. help, right? Um, which is what I did up here, right? I logged x to the x, I get ln of x to the x. I can then use a log property to simplify that, get rid of the exponent that was causing me trouble. Um, three, now we're going to differentiate implicitly. So, um, and then four, uh, solve for y prime. So that's the process of log differentiation. It's four steps. Um, so step one, log both sides of an equation. Uh, step two, and, and by the way, if there wasn't an equation before, like there wasn't here, you can create your own equation. You can set a variable equal to this thing, which is what I did here. Set y equals to that. So I can create my own equation. Um, just call the thing that I want to differentiate by some variable. Could be y, could be z, could be p, could be t, it doesn't matter. Um, just call it by something. Then you can log both sides of the equation. Use your log properties to simplify uh, the problematic side, which is going to be the right side. And you differentiate implicitly with respect to x or whatever the independent variable is. And then you solve for y prime. You replace your y because there's going to be a y in there because one side is ln y. So the derivative is going to be y prime over y to solve for y prime, you're gonna multiply by y. So there's gonna be a y in the answer, but just replace that y with the original function f of x and you would get uh, the answer. That's exactly what happened here. So that those, that's the process, those are the steps. Now I should mention, when is this useful? Um, This technique is useful
if um, there are several situations. Uh, one, we have a problematic uh, power uh, to deal with. So the power is not a constant or something like that. Um, or you just, you don't have a rule for the thing you're looking at and you want to try to use logs to simplify it. Um, and so you can do that. Uh, so logs are really good at taming exponentials. They turn exponentials into multiplication. Remember that. And then two, a situation is like, uh, if applying uh, previous rules, example, uh, product rule, quotient rule. Etc. Uh, would be would be very annoying, right? Um, so uh, I already gave an example of uh, a situation where you can do it if there's a problematic power. Let me give you an example of um, the second part, like where just. It's not something with a problematic exponent, but it's something where like you wouldn't really want to do it the way that you've been doing things because it would be really, really annoying. Um, so example uh, for case two. Find uh, d dx of. Uh, Here's something like x to the, well, radical x times x plus one to the three over two divided by say two x squared plus one to the seventh. I could throw in something else here just for good measure, e to the two x, right? So let's say you wanted to do that. Um, Technically, we know how to handle this based on what we've done before. We could do the quotient rule, obviously, um, but notice that within the quotient rule, you'd have to do the product rule because the top is a product and the denominator is a product. Also, within the product rule, you have to do the chain rule because if you look at things like 2x squared plus 1 to the seventh, you need the chain rule to handle that. Um, technically, you need the chain rule to handle x plus 1 to the 3 over 2 as well as e to the 2x. So these guys are, um, you're going to have to do a quotient rule while doing the quotient rule, do a product rule, while doing the product rule, do the chain rule. It's going to be very messy. It's not going to be fun. Um, and it's, uh, yeah. We would not want to do this directly. However, uh, log differentiation to the rescue. Um, what you can do is you can set y equals to that thing. And then uh, log both sides. Let's forget the square there. Right? So that thing that was very monstrous that we had to use a quotient rule, product rule, all that stuff for quotient rule do the product rule while doing the quotient rule, do the chain rule while doing the product rule, just like a bunch of nested rules. Um, now with the logarithm, 
uh, these guys kind of uh, break down into some very manageable things. So remember, it's logarithm of a division is going to be logarithm of the top minus log of the bottom. Log of a product is going to be log of the first term plus log of the second term, as well as we can bring powers down. So the first power, the, the first thing, the radical x is x to the one half. So the first term is going to be one half ln x plus three over two ln of x plus one. Uh, minus 7 ln of 2x squared plus 1 and minus ln of e to the 2x because there would have been uh, parentheses here with a plus and so I can just distribute the parentheses. So we have that. Okay. And now what? Um, this these guys like not bad to differentiate at all. The first one is going to be one over two x. The second one is going to be three over two times x plus one. Um, this one obviously the ln and e cancel. That's essentially just two x. The derivative of that is going to be two. Um, this one is going to be, well, seven times the derivative of the inside over the inside minus two, right? Which is not bad at all. That wasn't very complicated. I didn't need a bunch of parentheses. I didn't need product rule. I didn't need a, didn't need the quotient rule either. Um, I just needed a bunch of simple log rules. And so my Y prime is going to be Y times all of that. And literally the hardest part of this problem is just writing it out. <laughs> um, it's going to be uh, long to write out, but in terms of the mental effort you have to spend, it's almost zero or it should almost be zero. Um, so the Y was radical X, X plus one to the three over two over Two x squared plus one to the seventh e to the two x, and then I multiply by all of this. And that's my derivative. Right? Now you could try this the regular way um, if you don't take my word for it which you don't have to, I wouldn't be offended. Um, but it's like, mm, I'm gonna check up on Javon if this is really true. Do this the regular way and tell me which way was more fun and which way was easier. Um, I do uh, welcome it. Um, so once you actually go through that once, you're gonna realize, yeah, next time I'm gonna go with the logarithm. Um, so yeah, so here, it's not that it was, we didn't really know technically how to handle it. We had the machinery to handle it, but it would have been hella annoying, right? To apply the quotient rule and product rule and all that stuff. Um, but logs turn division into subtraction. They turn multiplication into addition. So um, they make things nicer. You can take powers and move them down in front of the log. It's, it's really nice. So logarithms have that. Um, so there are times when I'll give a problem with the log in it and you're supposed to use the log rules to simplify before doing any calculus. But there are other times where I wouldn't even give you anything with a log, but you can just choose to throw a log in there to make your life easier. Um, and that would be a nice way to do it. So those are a couple ways. Uh, so logs, obviously you would think if uh, you have an exponential, or like there's a power that's problematic, so it's not like a constant in the power, it's like a variable or a whole function maybe that's in the power. And that, that can indicate to you that, hey, log differentiation might be a good idea here. Um, now let me uh, give you an alternative. So, um, It functions on the same principles. 
Um, but it can be expressed differently. And it's kind of using another rule that we have. And so um, it allows us to get a logarithm in there, but it allows us to do it in a way that's uh, neater, more neat, I think. Um, so, and this way is to just recall that uh, anything, uh, you know, if that thing is like positive, Um, which a lot of times you can assume it is, um, uh, that is equal to e to the ln of that thing, right? So anything is e to the, right? Because we know that a to the log to the base a of x is just x. So pretty much if I have anything, um, I can actually rewrite it as an exponential using that rule. Just put a base and then put in the power of logarithm to the same base of that thing and you've now rewritten this exactly the same thing, but you rewrote it as an exponential. And moreover, you got a logarithm attached. You got that thing inside of a logarithm. And that is pretty useful. So let me show you an example here. So example, let's go back to the same guy we had before. Uh, we want to find d dx of x to the x. Now here's the benefit. And with this example, it's not going to be like a stark contrast, um, but think of the possibilities. Like here's the benefit to this method. You don't need to go to the side and set up a whole other equation. Like we don't need to go, all right, let's set y equals to this thing and then log both sides and blah, 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 and then multiply by y, blah, blah, blah. You can actually just rewrite the thing on the spot. You don't need to form some other equation and then just do the, the rules right there. Um, so here, what we could do is just right on the spot, I can rewrite this as e to the ln of that, right? This allows me to get a log attached to the original thing that I cared about, but it's in the power of an exponential. So this is just the derivative of, I can do that thing uh, where I bring the power down. Now, uh, remember what, how to differentiate exponentials. It's actually not so bad, right? Uh, we know that the derivative of e to the u is u prime e to the u. Derivative of e to the anything is the derivative of the power times the original function. So what we can do now is I can take the derivative of the power times the original function. Now, what is the derivative of the power? This is going to be the derivative of, um, so here, this is going to be the derivative of uh, x ln x. Which so, you know, you leave the x, uh, you differentiate the x, leave the ln, so we get ln, plus you leave the x, differentiate the ln, so you get x times one over x, and that gives you one. And then, you can uh, rewrite this guy as the original, x to the x. And so again, we get uh, the derivative of x to the x equals x to the x ln x plus one. Right? So we have, um, it's another way to get to the answer. So here, just notice I could just do everything in one spot. I didn't have to go and, oh, let's set y equals to blah and do it. I can just like rewrite it right away. And so that's uh, pretty nice. Um, another way to that, that you can see the benefits here. Um, Interesting. Okay. Another way you can see the benefits here is uh, let's look at a third example. Um, 
something like find the uh, if y equals say x squared plus x to the x squared, something like that, right? Um, then you'd realize that uh, there is a problem with the log differentiation method. So notice, uh, So um, a lot of students, many students, I've seen it many times, many students uh, would say something like the following. Well, I'm going to log both sides. So I'm going to get ln of y equals ln of x squared plus ln of x to the x squared, which is incorrect. Um, because Logging both sides would mean you have ln of y equals ln of uh, x squared plus x to the x squared. And logs don't distribute across sums. Right, So it's very common for a student to just think, oh, I can just put a logarithm in front of everything on the right side and we're good. Uh, no, no, you're not good. You can't do that because you literally just broke a log rule by doing that. You cannot, by logging both sides means just, oh, put a logarithm on each thing. Doesn't work. Um, logs do not distribute across sums. Uh, so that would be a very common mistake. Uh, for students to just, ah, let's just put a log in front of everything on the right side and we're good. Um, you're not. So you kind of end up in this situation where literally the only thing you can do is u prime over u. And it's like, if I knew how to do u prime, I wouldn't even do this. Like I would have just done it up here. That's my u right there. I would have just done u prime. Um, but here you put yourself in a situation where literally the only way out, the only mathematically correct way out is going to be the u prime over u. Um, so um, it's, not, it's not useful. So uh, does this mean we cannot use log differentiation? No, we can. You just have to be a little bit more careful. Uh, You just break things up first. Um, so you would literally have to do that thing where you kind of set up your own equation. Um, so I can do something like uh, y equals x squared plus x to the x squared. Now, x squared is not hard to differentiate, but x to the x squared is um, because we don't really have a direct rule for it. So what I can do here is just set um, something else, uh, g equals to x to the x squared. And then I can just perform log differentiation on that. So I isolate uh, the terms in a separate equation, right? If this, were, if this were something that I needed log differentiation for, I would have created another function. I would have said h equals x squared and then g equals x to the x squared. I would have to like set up separate functions for each of them. Um, okay, 
So now I can do a uh, log differentiation. Now I can do ln of g equals ln of x to the x squared. That's just x squared times ln x. Then I can differentiate uh, g prime over g. That's going to be 2x ln x plus x squared times 1 over x. So that's going to be g prime is going to be um, g times 2x ln x plus x. And so that's going to be x to the x squared times 2x ln x plus x. And I, yeah, I know, I know you can actually factor out a common x. Um, yeah, and then you would go, well, y is equal to x squared plus x, x, x to the x squared. And so you would know that y prime is going to be equal to, well, it's the derivative of a sum. So you can just take the sum of the derivatives. Uh, this we know by the power rule, that's 2x. And this we just calculated up here. Um, it's x to the x squared plus 1 times 2 ln x plus 1. So this guy here is just, you know, power rule. Didn't need anything fancy for that. And this here is what we computed above. Okay. So to do things properly with log differentiation, you have to be very careful. You have to set things up in this equation format and then log both sides. And if there's anything else uh, attached to it, um, you have to deal with that first. Um, deal with it separately. So that's kind of annoying that you have this one equation and you need to set up another equation to kind of uh, plug into that original equation. Uh, so that's a little bit annoying. Um, with the alternative, uh, if I were to ask you y equals uh, x squared plus x to the x squared. Um, I could just rewrite in one shot, right? So I, I rewrite on the spot. This is just going to be e to the x squared ln x. And then I can just differentiate. That's going to be 2x plus the derivative of the power times the original function. And that's going to be 2x ln x plus x squared times 1 over x. And so that's going to be 2x plus 2x ln x plus x times x to the x squared. And we can rewrite that if we want. Um, So you can kind of do everything all in one. Like you don't need to go and, all right, let's set up a separate equation for this guy, a separate equation for that guy. Let's do them one at a time. You don't need to go through all that trouble. Um, you can just uh, do it all on the spot, essentially, just by rewriting um, anything as e to the ln of that thing. Um, and yeah, um, anything can be e to the ln of that thing. All right. Any questions on this uh, log differentiation or this different way to kind of do log differentiation because you're still putting a logarithm in there, um, but it's not as like, you know, show offy, right? Like, it's like this guy's like making a big deal of himself. Um, yeah. Any questions about this?
um, because we are going to be using this stuff or this kind of maneuver later. So I want to make sure that we we understand. Okay. So what I want to do now is it's kind of a throwback, but not really. I want to teach you guys a new uh, limit technique, um, but it's a technique that I couldn't teach you before when we were doing limits because you actually need derivatives to do it. So um, it would have been like we didn't know when we were doing limits, we didn't know what a derivative was at the time. So now I want to actually introduce a new limit technique. Ta -da. Um, so what we want to do is a topic called indeterminate forms and uh, called L'Hôpital's. I want to put this on one line. And L'Hôpital's. You have to say it with a French accent, or you could get the problem wrong if you don't. One of the uh, a pro tip there. Um, so L'Hôpital was the name of a French guy. Um, his name was literally hospital, because that's how you say uh, hospital in French. I, I don't really know why, why that was his name, but that was his name. Uh, he didn't come up with the rule. I think he hired one of the Bernoullis. Like, uh, you know, mathematicians back in those days, they were kind of like people you could hire to do stuff. <laughs> like bards or something like, oh, sing me a song. You could just like go hire a mathematician. Oh, invent me a rule and put my name on it. Uh, so that's kind of what happened. Uh, one of the Bernoullis was like a powerhouse math family. It's like, I don't know. Um, there was a family of people called Bernoullis and it's like, they're all like mathematicians or something and their their name is a big deal. Okay, so uh, this guy looked at ax, this guy was a patron of uh, one of the Bernoullis who came up with this rule. And uh, it was basically a way to deal with indeterminate forms, which we are going to be talking about. So here is the idea. So what is an indeterminate form? An indeterminate form is a limit form. Um, so it's like you're trying to take a limit and you're looking at the form that that limit's going to take, like how is it's going to behave. So it's a limit form that cannot be evaluated at face value. Um, there are seven of them. This is what uh, one of the uh, the things that I, I always forget. One of these guys, um, like I, I know it when I see it, but like every time I try to list out all seven of them, like on the spot, like I always forget somebody. Um, so. Let's see here. Um, one is uh, zero to the zero. So that's indeterminate um, because zero to the zero doesn't make any sense. Remember uh, zero power, the way that we conceptualize that was it's like a division, can't divide by zero. Um, it's also just not clear um, what that should be. So the idea is uh, because there are competing ideas, um, it's not clear what this should be because on one hand, you're like, well, the base is zero, so it should be zero. But on the other hand, it's like, well, the power is zero, so it should be one. 
Uh, so you're like, well, is it zero or one? Because like the base is zero and the power is zero. Uh, you don't really know. So you can't really determine it at face value. Uh, the truth is as a limit form, it might not be either of those numbers. So that's one of them. Another one is infinity to the zero. Again, for the same reason, like you can't really say what that's going to be. Because on one hand, you're like, well, the base is infinity, right? It should be infinity, you know? Like, like infinity is not even like a number. It should overwhelm the power zero thing. Like, uh, but other people are like, well, I mean, the power is zero. Shouldn't it be one? Um, and yeah, you can't know, uh, not at face value. In fact, it can be neither of those things. Uh, another one is one to the infinity. On one hand, the base is one, you should really get one. On the other hand, you're like, well, if the power of something is like positive infinity, like you should get like positive infinity, right? Um, so it's kind of weird. Another one is uh, zero times infinity. Because again, on one hand, anything multiplied by zero should be zero. But on the other hand, you multiply anything by infinity should kind of be infinity. So it's not clear at phase value what this should be. Um, another one, is infinity minus infinity, right? Now this one might seem weird, um, but there are different sizes to infinity. That's not really what's going on here though. The idea is if you have two functions where you're taking a limit and they're both heading towards infinity, one could reach infinity a lot quicker than the other one. Or uh, so it could be like the second infinity uh, represents a bigger infinity in the sense that it gets much larger than the first one does. And so this would go off to negative infinity. Or it could be that the first one gets to infinity first, so it's much larger than the second one, and then the answer would be positive infinity. But it's also possible that they're kind of the same rate. One is just a little bit a factor off of the other one. So it could actually end up being any other random number. could also end up not existing as a limit. So these guys here, it's not really clear what they should be, especially as a limit form. Um, there are another two as well. Um, zero over zero. So that's bad for obvious reasons. You can't divide by zero. So on one hand, it's like, well, whenever a fraction has zero in the top, that means the fraction is zero. On the other hand, it's like, well, you can't divide by zero. It doesn't really make sense. Um, so on one hand, it's like, is this zero or is it something else or is it meaningless? Um, so as a direct computational thing, it's of course meaningless. Division by zero is always meaningless, but this is not like a computational thing. This is a limit form. So this is like, uh, you're taking a limit of a division and the top and the bottom function are approaching zero. So you want to think of these guys as, um, uh, we are approaching these guys. Um, right? So it's not like, oh, someone actually tried to plug into their calculator zero to the zero. Like that, that obviously doesn't make any sense. Um, but it's like uh, things are getting closer to zero or infinity in these particular patterns. Another one would be uh, infinity over infinity. For the same reason, uh, the top infinity could be bigger than the bottom one, in which case the answer is infinity. Uh, the bottom infinity could be bigger, in which case the answer would be zero, or they could be actually very kind of close, in which case the answer could be a number, or uh, it could also does not exist, is also another possibility. Um, so yeah, uh, is that seven? One, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, I think that's all of them. I think I got all of them. Congratulations, Javon, pat on the back. All right, yeah, yeah, that's good. So now here's the thing. Um, and of course with the, uh, with the infinity, this could be plus or minus, it's not, uh, it doesn't matter. Now, here's the thing. Uh, we do have a way to deal with indeterminate forms. The catch is um, we only know how to deal with two of them directly. 
And it's the two here that I wrote out separately. Um, that's called L'Hôpital Zeru. So indeterminate form, it's just these limit forms that we can't really determine what they are. And we are going to use a rule to figure out what they are, essentially. Um, but however, we can't really apply this in any of the other five cases on the left. We can only do it on the two cases on the right. Um, the idea being, um, uh, We cannot deal with these forms directly. Uh, we must uh, rewrite them. To be able to do um, computations. Uh, now that I told you that, let's actually look at L'Hôpital's rule. Uh, uh, so here's what L'Hôpital's rule says. L'Hôpital. Like when you're actually doing the computation, you have to say it with a French accent. Uh, consider uh, the limit of f x over g of x, um, where a may be plus or minus infinity, right? So it could be a limit at infinity. It doesn't have to be, though. OK? Um, Here's something that's very important. If this limit approaches the form approaches either of the forms, um, zero over zero. Um, that is, uh, uh, F approaches zero and G approaches zero as X approaches A or infinity over infinity, uh, plus or minus. This means that F approaches infinity and G approaches infinity as plus or minus f approaches plus or minus infinity g approaches plus or minus infinity as x approaches a right so that would leave you with this so we have the limit of a division what if the top and the bottom both are getting close to zero as x gets close to a or what if the top and the bottom are getting close to infinity as x gets close to a um, Then uh, L'Hopital's rule says the following. The limit as x approaches a of this function will be equal to the following limit, uh, which is surprising and beautiful. It's going to be the derivative of the top function divided by the derivative of the bottom function, and you take the same limit. And uh, I'll just put whenever the first limit exists. There are some conditions uh, that you can have on this, but it basically boils down to 
whenever the original limit that you're looking at actually exists, uh, this will work. Um, in theory, it can work. Uh, so this is uh, L'Hopital's rule. It's basically it. So you have the, um, and let me emphasize, you can only apply this rule in this scenario. Okay, you can't just do it whenever you want. Um, if the limit approaches one of these two specific forms, it does not apply to any of the forms on the left. It only applies to these two forms on the right, zero over zero or infinity over infinity. If your limit approaches one of these two forms, then uh, the original limit that you have, if it exists, it will actually be the same value as the derivative of the top divided by the derivative of the bottom. Um, so it's not like I'm doing a quotient rule or anything. I'm just differentiate the top and differentiate the bottom and take the same limit. Um, and that's L'Hopital's rule. Um, another thing I would say to note, uh, note uh, L'Hopital's rule. can be applied uh, repeatedly. Okay, so occasionally what can happen is that you can try to take a limit and it approaches zero over zero, infinity over infinity. You do L'Hopital's rule, so you differentiate the top, you differentiate the bottom, and you take the limit again. And that kind of behavior happens again. Like you again get zero over zero, infinity over infinity. Um, it turns out that you could apply L'Hopital's rule a second time or a third time or a fourth time. You can apply it any number of times you'd like. Um, now, the, I, the trick is though, doing this just willy nilly can get you in trouble because you can end up in a situation where you'll just be taking derivatives forever and never get anywhere. So, um, however, it is important. So from a calculation perspective, a mechanical perspective, um, to simplify and check whether uh, you can compute the limit after each application. Okay, so it can be applied repeatedly, but you don't just want to just spam L'Hopital's rule like that. You just want to do it when you have to, right? You have this condition, uh, you try to apply L'Hopital's rule, see if it works out, um, but you would have to check, okay, if I simplify and try to take the limit again, does it work now? Um, you might realize that you get L'Hopital's rule again and you just, uh, you do it again. Um, yeah, let's uh, do some examples. And I think I put a L'Hopital's rule uh, problem on the uh, test one in like the bonus. So if you uh, read ahead, you might've had, uh, shot here. Let's do um, a, a limit as x approaches zero of sine x over x. Now I know you know what this is, the answer is one, but we're actually going to do it another way. Uh, B e to the x over x, C L of x over x. Um, now these three, uh, you should know the answer to these. Right away, uh, but we'll illustrate. Lupita's
anyway, right? Um, so if you look at these limits and you actually don't know what the answer is within a few seconds, you gotta check yourself before you wreck yourself, okay? Um, based on the rules that I've gave, given you before. Like one of them, this is like a direct formula. It's one of the special trig limits. You should know that by heart. Um, the other two, it's uh, the concept of top heavy and bottom heavy should immediately give you the answer in a few seconds, right? So uh, B, the answer is infinity and C, the answer is zero. You should kind of know that just by looking at them. But I'm going to go through L'Hopital's rule just for you to see that we are getting the answers that we expect anyway. Um, not as a proof of L'Hopital's rule, but it kind of, um, at least at the Calc 1 level, it kind of convinces us that uh, we're probably uh, doing the right thing. If in every situation that I, I know I, that what the answer should be, I do actually get this answer doing this rule, um, it's probably the right rule. Uh, but of course, uh, we haven't uh, proven it. So those are the first three examples, just to uh, do something nicer. The other is though, I don't think um, we would know how to do these by heart. D probably, but it's kind of borderline. It's kind of sketchy uh, doing with this one. So it's going to be limit as X approaches zero from the right of X times ln X. Parenthesis. Uh, e. Uh, we want limit as x approaches zero from the right of x raised to the x. F um, limit as x approaches infinity of one plus one over x to the x. Uh, G limit as X approaches infinity of E to the X minus X. H um, limit as X approaches one from the right, one over ln X minus one over One over x minus one. Um, maybe I could actually, while we're here, let me uh, look up. Oh, it was very similar to this one. I thought I'd put a different example. Uh, I bonus um, limit as X approaches infinity of one plus two over N, N approaches infinity. One plus two over N to five to the N. Um, was on test one bonus. So you can see if you did, if you attempted this, you can see if uh, you got the right answer. And if you kind of wrote it, wrote it out the way you should. Um, yeah, it's actually very similar to this one though. I was considering doing two problems, but I, I figured they're both kind of nice. I randomly picked that one. Um, yeah, so let's actually get through those guys.
So there we go. the notes again. Okay, so the link to the notes in the chat in case you want to look at the rest of the problems, maybe try one over the break. Um, Okay, so here's the first one. We actually know um, that the answer should be one. We should know. Um, pretty sure it even came up in test one. So let's actually see how we could do this with L'Hopital's rule, even though we know that the answer is one. Um, so what you'll notice here is that um, as X approaches zero, what happens to the sine of x? It approaches zero, right? Because sine of zero is zero. And as x approaches zero, what happens to the denominator? Well, it approaches zero because the denominator is zero. So this guy approaches zero is zero. Now this is an indeterminate form. And uh, lucky for us, a convenient one. Because uh, we can take it to the hospital, right? Uh, you can apply L'Hopital's rule. Now, when you're applying L'Hopital's rule, um, you would indicate that, or at least here's how I want you to indicate it. You don't have to like write out a sense, oh, I'm going to do L'Hopital's rule or buy L'Hopital's rule this. Um, here's how we do it. I write a little uh, L apostrophe H over the equal sign here. So this uh, indicates we are applying You just put an L apostrophe H over the equal sign. I will know that you're doing L'Hopital's rule and you know you're doing L'Hopital's rule. Um, and so what L'Hopital's rule says is that this original limit, since it's approaching zero over zero, it will be the same as the limit as X approaches zero of cosine x over x, um, because that's the derivative of the sine x. Uh, derivative of x is just actually 1. Um, so if this, if this were like f and that was g, then this is f prime, and that's g prime, which now um, it's kind of uh, easy to see. This is going to approach cosine of zero, which we know is one, uh, which is the answer we know we should have gotten. So, I mean, uh, if hell freezes over and you forgot this rule, you can derive it again using L'Hopital's rule, but you shouldn't. You shouldn't forget that. Don't forget this rule. Um, limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x is 1. Don't forget. Um, but yeah, it approaches 0 over 0. We can apply L'Hopital's rule. We get the expected answer because um, the rule works. So uh, similarly here, um, any questions on this, like um, what I did, how I did it? So um, here's another one. So you realize if we start to actually take limits and see what's going on, um, notice that this approaches 
Well, as X approaches infinity, E to the X approaches infinity. And as X approaches infinity, X approaches infinity. So again, infinity over infinity. Again, indeterminate form. Uh, what we can do is we can apply differentiate the top derivative of e to the x is e to the x differentiate the bottom derivative of x is one and so this is just the limit as x approaches infinity of e to the x which obviously is infinity which um, makes sense because this is top heavy So again, we kind of knew that was the answer. I did mention that, you know, exponentials, increasing exponentials increase way faster than any polynomial. So your e to the x is going to overwhelm the x. It's top heavy. So the top is going to infinity a lot faster than the bottom is going to infinity. So you have a fraction where the numerator is huge, denominator is relatively small. Um, you get a huge number as a result. For this one, um, again, you can know that it's bottom heavy, so you expect the answer to be zero. Um, let's see. What you would notice here is that as you approach infinity, again, ln x approaches infinity because it just increases like that. Um, as x approaches infinity, x approaches infinity, um, it's an indeterminate form, and it's a, it's a nice one. So applying L'Hopital's rule, take the same limit, and I differentiate the top divided by the derivative of the bottom. This leaves me with the limit as x approaches, as x approaches infinity of just one over x. And we know that as x approaches infinity of one over x, the denominator becomes huge, the top becomes small, and that's zero. Again, which makes sense. is uh, bottom heavy. Okay. So that's L'Hopital's rule on the, uh, the easy guys, the guys where we kind of already knew the answer. We didn't actually need L'Hopital's rule. Um, All right, so let's uh, let's get serious now. All right, so this guy. Okay, want the limit of as x approaches zero from the right of x times ln x. Now, because x is approaching zero from the right, it's always slightly positive, so our, our logarithm is always going to be defined. Um, you'll always have x greater than zero. but it's getting closer and closer to zero. So now um, when you start to think about what would this thing look like? What, what, would, what would it approach, right? If I look at this as face value, um, you would notice that, well, X is approaching zero from the right. So my X is approaching zero. Um, and in LN X approaching zero from the right, well, you would get negative infinity. So that's like a zero times infinity in determinate form. Um, not convenient. Um, so it's indeterminate because you have zero times infinity, like who's gonna win? Is it zero? Is it infinity? Um, yeah, not clear. And by the way, you can know that the logarithm would approach negative infinity because you know the graph. Um, 
as you get close to zero, the logarithm goes like, Phew. Um, so yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, so we have that. Now we're kind of at an impasse. Well, we're not really, but um, what we can do here is apply algebra. Uh, we can rewrite with the power of friendship, you know, the power of algebra. Um, here's one way we could rewrite this limit. Um, you can't, and remember, Lopez's rule only works on divisions, right? So it's like an F over G kind of situation, right? So if we want to get to a point where we can use Lopez's rule, it's probably nice to get to a division kind of scenario. So the question is, how can I write a multiplication as a division? Well, the idea is you can use a reciprocal, essentially. So basically, we know that 1 over 1 over x is just equal to x, right? Keep change flip. So I can apply that here. I can divide by x because uh, x is not 0. Um, so first of all, OK, since x not equal to 0, also 1 over 1 over x equals x. So that means 1 over 1 over x times ln x equals x ln x. Um, so I can actually rewrite this limit. Now, so we have now you can check uh, what it approaches. As you approach zero from the right, L and X will approach uh, infinity, in fact, negative infinity. Now, as you approach zero from the right of one over x, you know that the graph looks like this. I don't know if it actually mirrors my image. Hopefully, you're getting out on the right side. The right side shoots up. The left side shoots down. The right side is the side we care about because x is greater than zero. So that goes to infinity. This is indeterminate. Convenient. This is something that we can apply Lopto's rule on. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take it to the hospital, apply uh, Lopto's rule. Um, and then what I can do is I'm going to differentiate the top divided by the derivative of the bottom. Now, at this point, you would check what's going on. Um, you would notice that. This is going to infinity in the top. The denominator is going to negative infinity. Um, but if you were to do that, technically you're making a mistake. That is true, but uh, hold up. Uh, Javon said to simplify. Um, if you keep this up, you'd literally go forever. You'd literally keep repeating uh, getting 0 over 0. Um, uh, infinity over infinity. Forever. Forever. Okay. So instead, what we would want to do is we simplify. So before you even think of applying a second Lopto's rule, remember the principle. You always apply lower level things before higher level things. Before you decide, oh, am I going to hit it with Lopto's rule? Simplify first. Apply the algebra rule before you get to the calculus rule. Um, this is obviously something that can be simplified a lot. Um, in fact, that simplifies to um, minus x. Right? It'll be 1 over x times 
minus x squared if you keep change flip. And now that's actually pretty clear. It's not even indeterminate. It, I can clearly see what that is. Um, x is approaching zero of minus x, it goes to zero. And there, uh, there we have it. So the answer here is zero. Um, now you could kind of guess this, but I think it's pretty risky. Um, the idea is X is approaching zero faster than this guy's approaching infinity because we know how uh, these functions behave. Um, but I think you can get in trouble with that here. Um, that top heavy, bottom heavy thing, I think is better with fractions, not with the products. You can actually get in trouble. Um, but that would be it. And uh, we are about at the halfway mark. I'm going to take a break here. Um, can break for 10 minutes. Try to think about this problem. I might ask you, one of you to see uh, how we would do it next time uh, after the break. But we will stop there for now. Um, yeah, go uh, drink some water, uh, refill your coffee, stretch, walk around. I will um, see you guys in a little bit. Let's stop recording. Okay. Show will start in seven minutes.
show will start in six minutes. start in five minutes. start in four minutes. start in three minutes. The show will start in two minutes.
The show will start in one minute. And we're back. Okay, so um, moving on to the next, another example. Did anyone have any ideas here? I mean, we can see as x is approaching zero, this approach is zero over zero, which is indeterminate. Um, not conveniently so, though. Um, so any ideas on how we can deal with that? Would you want to start with doing logarithmic differentiation? Well, no, you can't really differentiate. So remember L'Hopital's rule says, if I have this form, I can differentiate the top and the bottom. You can't just differentiate the whole limit, but uh, logarithms is I, kind of the right direction. Um, yeah, zero as a base by itself is fine, but raising it to the zero power is like an issue. So the power is an issue. So you might want to use logarithms. You could actually do that. You could say um, set y to be equal to this limit. Then what you could do is you could log both sides. Um, and that would get you the logarithm in play. Um, and then uh, you can actually move the limit outside the logarithm, because remember, limits can move in and out of continuous functions. Right, so um, here uh, we log both sides. Here limits uh, move, limits pass through, I believe is how we phrase it. Limits pass through uh, continuous functions. So I can move the limit from inside the logarithm to outside the logarithm. And uh, yeah, now what you'll notice is the logarithm allows us to simplify uh, that thing. This gives us the limit as X approaches zero of um, x, l, and x. Now what you'll notice about that guy is uh, he's the guy we did before. Um, so uh, what we did here was simplify with logs. Uh, we get the previous example. Now, just to reiterate, I'm going to go over it again, but
but I could just plug in the answer we got last time here and it wouldn't matter. So you have this now and you're going to realize, well, now I have, I got the logarithm in there, but now I have a zero times infinity, which is another indeterminate form, but not convenient. Uh, if I have a multiplication, the way to get a division is to take the reciprocal of one of the factors and move it under. Right, so that's like a standard technique for you guys now, just so just so you know. Like if I have a multiplication one turn into a vision, division, I can just take a reciprocal of one factor and put it underneath. Um, so I would get this. And now I would realize, oh, well, that's infinity over infinity, technically negative infinity over infinity. I would be able to apply L'Hopital's rule. And that basically gives me one over X over minus one over X squared. Here again, I would simplify before trying to do anything else. And then I would get zero. Um, so is zero the answer? Well, it's not. Um, so the reason why is because you need to remember what the left side is. Left side is ln y. Um, the uh, limit we want is actually y, but we've just found ln of y, right? That's what we put in here. So what I need to do now is just exponentiate both sides. So I have to undo the logarithm that I put in, right? Because I actually changed the function there. Um, so my y would be equal to e to the zero, which is one. And so, of course, that means the limit that's equal to one, right? So that's, yeah, that's one way to do it. So yeah, if, some, if a power is problematic, use a logarithm. That's a standard uh, procedure now. Um, uh, but be careful, you don't want to just, um, uh, common misconception is that you, uh, you can just differentiate any limit you want to actually take the limit. That's not true. It's, uh, if you have these two forms, you can differentiate the top and the bottom and get a limit. Uh, you can't compute a limit by taking a derivative. Um, you have to take a limit of the division of the derivatives if you have these two cases. You're not allowed to do it in any other case, right? So currently um, we're with here, like as it stands, you wouldn't think log differentiation because you don't have a reason to differentiate. You don't have a division. It's not a, good, a convenient um, indeterminate form. Like you shouldn't be thinking derivatives yet because it, it won't apply um, because it's a zero to the zero. There's no derivative. You can't do a derivative for that. Um, I will also mention that here, you would of course have to remember to carry the ln of y with you. Um, so if you don't wanna do that, I should mention that what we said was the alternative to log differentiation, something similar to that will also work. Um, so I should, So I should mention it, um, an alternative. Remember we can rewrite things in the same spot using that e to the ln rule. So if I have the limit as x approaches zero of x to the x, I could immediately write this as the limit as x approaches zero of e to the ln of x to the x. So this is going to be a uh, limit as x approaches zero from the right of e to the x ln x. And again, limits pass through continuous functions. So this is e to the limit Okay. 
And so now you can actually do Hopital's rule in the power. Um, so this would be e to the limit of ln x over one over x. That would be e to the limit. Now apply L'Hopital's rule, we would get one over x divided by minus one over x squared. And so that's going to be e to the limit. This simplifies into minus x, which gives you e to the zero, which gives you one. Right, and here you'll realize that I didn't have to remember to like undo an ln because I rewrote it in the same spot. Like I didn't have to do anything after that. I just now I'm just doing, I'm computing the limit in the power of an exponential. So the exponential is always there. Like I'm not going to forget that I had to raise it to the e. So I think that's uh, two benefits here. Um, you can rewrite in the spots so you don't have to go separately and oh set y equals to this thing, um, as well as you don't run the risk of like uh, forgetting that what you found was ln of y and not actual y. Um, so you wanna be careful with that. Um, and so that's kind of like why I like the alternative to the log differentiation kind of procedure um, to logging both sides. I would prefer to say e to the ln of something. If you don't like that, you don't have to do it, but I think it ends up being easier and um, kind of more compact in pretty much every case where you would apply this kind of logic. Um, yeah, so that's how we could do that. But yeah, good, good spotting that uh, a logarithm would be useful um, because, you know, the power. Um, ba -ba -ba, ba -ba -ba. Here's another one. And if the last one taught us anything, it's that uh, we know when we have something to a power, uh, we can actually use the logarithm as a trick. So this one you will notice as x goes to infinity, one over x goes to zero. So the denominator goes to one and the power x as x goes to infinity will go to infinity. So this is one to the infinity indeterminate. Um, not convenient though. Right, but uh, we do know that we don't want that power there. So what we can do is um, yeah, I'm gonna do the one where I rewrite on the spot. This is e to the ln of of that. So this is going to be um, e to the ln um, limit of, right. So in the in limit of, I could have done that in one step, but let me take an extra step. So now if I look at the limit up here, um, I'd realize that that will go to infinity times um, log of one is zero indeterminate again. But I can do that trick. I have a product. I can turn it into a division, which is what I need for L'Hopital's rule by taking the reciprocal of one of these guys. So this is going to be um, uh, ln of one plus one over x divided by one over X. And now I can apply L'Hopital's rule because if you look at this guy, it actually gives you zero over zero. So once I get that division, 
and I realize that it's approaching zero over zero or infinity over infinity, only then I can apply L'Hopital's rule. Only then does uh, something like differentiation enter my mind. Um, it wasn't there before. Um, so now um, I can just differentiate the top, differentiate the bottom. So derivative of ln of one plus one over x, that's one over one plus one over x times the derivative, which is minus one over x squared, divided by the derivative of one over x is minus one over x squared. Um, so that cancels that pretty much. Um, and so we have e to the limit as x approaches infinity of one over one plus one over x. Um, this part here is going to go to zero. Uh, so we have e to the one. So that's just, well, that's e. And um, this is another one, um, actually not a surprise. I don't know if you would see it. Um, Um, right away, but uh, the limit as x approaches infinity of one plus one over x to the x is one of the definitions of e. Um, we actually did that, don't remember where. Was the previous one? Yeah, it was before derivatives. I think it was at the end of limits, probably. There we go. <laughs> um, that's uh, this one right here. That's the uh, definition. That's exactly the limit that we found, except instead of n's, I have x's. It was a while back. Um, where are we? Here. Um, Here's another uh, problem type. If you look at this one, uh, you'll realize that, well, uh, e to the x as x goes to infinity is going to be infinity and x as x goes to infinity is going to be infinity. So what we have here is a, a good old classic infinity minus infinity, right, which is I mean, it's indeterminate. But not useful. So what we can do is um, the standard approach to when you have a subtraction of stuff and you want to get to say a division of things so you can evaluate it. Um, we know how to get to, uh, to a division of things if we had a multiplication of things. Right, you turn one into a reciprocal. So the steps would be first go from the subtraction version to a multiplication version, and then go from the multiplication version to the division version. And that way we can see, does L'Hopital's rule apply? And we can actually figure it out from there. Now, how do you go from a subtraction to a multiplication is the question. Um, but it's actually not so bad. Um, it is something that you've been doing uh, for a very, very long time, actually. Um, this is what factoring is, right? You wanna go from a sum representation to a product representation of something, that's factoring. That's exactly what it is, right? So um, I can factor this guy. And 
uh, you might say, what would we factor? There are no common terms. But the truth is you can factor anything out of anything uh, as long as you're not factoring out zero. Because factoring really just means you multiply and divide by the same thing and then bring the division part inside the parentheses. Um, so what I can do here is I could um, say factor out x. Uh, so I could have like factor out x. Here I would have e to the x over x. So I multiply and divide by x over x, but I just put the division inside. And I would have that. Now, this guy, uh, as x approaches infinity, we have actually seen that before. This was in a previous example. Um, yeah, x to the x over x. So this here would actually, so by L'Hopital's earlier, we know that this approach is infinity and X we also know is approaching infinity. So here we have infinity times infinity. Um, what is that? How do we, what do we do here? Do we divide by one over X, the reciprocal? Uh, yeah, but do we need to? I mean, doesn't it have to be like infinity over infinity? Right, but uh, when when do we do that? Um, it's if we have an indeterminate form and we want to transform it into a convenient one, right? The question is, is this an indeterminate form? Right, so um, what I want to introduce to you is this concept. This is not indeterminate. Um, so yeah, I, I know I introduced these forms today, but eventually you'll have them memorized. Um, infinity times infinity is not here because infinity times infinity is actually something you can take at base, face value. Like I have a huge number multiplied by a huge number. What's gonna happen? You're gonna get a huge number, right? So infinity times infinity is actually just infinity. It's not something that you uh, have any competing ideas about. Right. What makes these guys indeterminate is because they're competing ideas and you don't know who's going to win, like zero times infinity. Like you have this concept that zero times anything should be zero, but infinity times anything should be infinity. So you have this cross uh, cross purposes. It's like it doesn't they don't it doesn't make sense, like zero times infinity. Like what what is that? Um, it could be zero. It could be infinity. It could be something else. Uh, we had that here. Zero times infinity is what we had for this. And it turns out in this case to be equal to one. Um, so yeah, this is actually not indeterminate. Infinity times infinity is just infinity. Um, so realize here, uh, we didn't even need L'Hopital's rule here. Um, not to say that we never will, uh, but in this case, we didn't, um, because once we start to factor stuff and start come uh, get it into a more convenient form, um, we realize that oh, this is actually not indeterminate at all. And another thing is, it should be kind of obvious here, but it's okay if you don't see it right away, uh, because it's e to the x minus x. E to the x is going to get huge way before x gets huge. So e to the x is running off to infinity a lot faster than the X is running off to infinity. So you're going to have a huge number eventually subtracting a very small number. So it kind of makes sense that this should approach a huge number. Um, and when you factor it though, that's clear. Like that's not even, that's not even speculation at this point. Uh, something huge times something huge gives you something huge. Um, there's no like, uh, 
like unsureness about that. So here's another. Uh, we have limit as x approaches one from the right of um, one over ln x minus one over x minus one. So uh, let's actually check what this is. Okay, so let's think if uh, ln x, I'm approaching one from the right, I know that log of one is zero. So this is going to approach uh, zero from the right. Yeah. Minus, if I'm approaching one from the right, that means I'm a always a little bit bigger than one. So x is a little bit bigger than one, and then I'm subtracting one, which means I'm always going to get something slightly positive. So again, this is that, which leads us to <laughs> equals uh, infinity minus infinity, right? So we have that uh, again, right? So know how to analyze functions, know our functions very well. Uh, we should know how a logarithm behaves, all that. And so, yeah, if we're approaching one from the right, my log is going to approach zero from the right. If I approach one from the right, the expression x minus one is going to approach zero from the right again. And then I have one over these. So I have infinity minus infinity. Now, um, before we did the factoring thing, um, which we could do here. A another thing I would see though, is that these are just two fractions. I could combine them into one big fraction and immediately get a division. Um, so we have a couple things we can do here. Maybe I'll do, uh, Uh, both of them. Um, normally what I do is like I, I would combine these two fractions, but um, we could also do the subtraction. Uh, let's method one. Uh, combine the fractions. Because I already have a bunch of divisions, but I, I just want one big division to apply L'Hopital's rule. And see, would it give me zero over zero, infinity over infinity? I don't know, uh, combine the fractions. So this is going to be the limit as X approaches one from the right of X minus one minus L and X all over X minus one times L and X. Um, yeah, so um, what would this approach? If X is approaching one, X minus one is approaching zero and L and X is approaching zero. So the top goes to zero. If X is approaching one, X minus one approaches zero and the uh, L and X is approaching zero. So it's zero, zero over zero, right? Um, this would approach one minus one minus zero. The denominator would approach zero times zero. So this gives you a zero over zero. Um, indeterminate form. Which means uh, that's actually a convenient one. L'Hopital's rule applies to that one. Let's take it to the hospital. L'Hopital's rule. Derivative of the top, derivative of x is one, derivative of ln x is one over x. In the bottom, you need product rule. Is some multiplication of functions. Differentiate the first one, leave the second, uh, plus leave the first, differentiate the second. Um, I'd wanna simplify this, multiply by x over x. Um, x minus one over, um, x ln x plus x minus one. All right, uh, what now? So as x approaches one, x minus one approaches zero. 
as x approaches one, this approach is one times zero plus, well, zero. So we again get zero over zero. What do we do? Well, you hit it with, hit it with L'Hopital's again. L'Hopital's again. We can actually do it multiple times. So this uh, limit is going to be equal to the previous limit, but that previous limit was equal to the original limit. So assuming they exist, I don't even know if it's going to exist by the time I get to the end. So I can hit it with L'Hopital's again. Derivative of the top is one in this case. Derivative of the bottom is ln x plus one plus one. Um, because differentiate the x, leave the ln x, that's one times ln x, which is just ln x. Uh, leave the x, differentiate the ln x, that's x times one over x, which is the one. So that's the product rule here. And then derivative of x is one, derivative of the minus one is zero, so you just get one. And at this point, um, L'Hopital's won't apply because the numerator is not zero and it's not infinity, the numerator is one. Um, so at this point, I would actually just uh, take the limit. That's gonna be one over zero plus one plus one. The answer is actually a half here. Who would have thought infinity minus infinity is a half? Um, so that's one thing we could do. Um, combine the fractions, get one big fraction, uh, hit it with uh, no patels. And in this case, we had to hit it twice. Um, I guess another trick we could do. So if I see a subtraction of infinities, I would think like the factoring trick. If I see a subtraction of infinities, but they're already fractions, I would probably combine it into one big fraction. Um, um, method two, let's see if we can do it the factoring way, factor. So at the limit as X approaches one from the right of one over ln X minus one over X minus one. Yes. So, I mean, what could I factor here? Maybe the one over X minus one. That would leave me with X minus one over ln X uh, minus one. So now this gives us uh, well, I can apply L'Hopital's here because this part will go to zero over zero. This part here would approach infinity. Although I could put it um, in the denominator. Yeah, the factoring version here is a little bit tricky. Now, if you look at this guy, you'd have to apply like L'Hopital's rule inside of L'Hopital's rule. Um, this will be the limit as X approaches one from the right of differentiate the top, differentiate the bottom. Uh, and so that would give you one. And then, so on top you have one minus one. So this whole thing actually approaches zero over zero again. So I can hit it with L'Hopital's here. Then I have to do the quotient rule. That's gonna be annoying. Uh, bottom times the of the top minus the top times the of the bottom over the bottom squared. 
over one I can multiply this by x over x. And that goes to if x approaches one. Sorry, I left the parentheses here. That would again go to zero over zero. Hit it with locales again. Um, that would be ln x plus one minus one over ln x squared um, plus leave the x, differentiate this, this is two times ln x over x. So this would be the limit as x approaches one. Um, so in the top, you have ln of x, and in the bottom, here x says we cancel. I would factor out an ln x. I would have ln x plus two down there. These guys would cancel. And again, I would get a half. That, that was kind of annoying. Um, Cause I had to do a L'Hopital's rule to figure out that the numerator went to zero. Then I had to do like the quotient rule. Um, yeah, it's kind of annoying. Um, if your algebra is a little shaky, like method two probably isn't what you want to do. Yeah, so I, I would recommend if you have two fractions, just combine the fractions into one big fraction. Um, um, but yeah, this one, uh, kind of the same thing, uh, as the one that we got E earlier on. Um, so let's just actually go through that. I think this is the last example for like L'Hopital's, yes. And this was the example that was on the test. Uh, so here's how it would have looked. Um, you could like set Y equals this and log both sides, but I would do the E to the, well, five N times LN one plus two over N. Um, right, bring the five end down. Um, and then I would have E move the limit up. I can do this. Realize that the limit in the power uh, goes to log of one, which is zero. As n goes to infinity, one over five n goes to zero, uh, zero as well. And uh, so I can apply L'Hopital's rule. Uh, derivative of that is one over one plus two over n times minus two over n squared is gonna be the derivative of that. And this is going to be one fifth times minus one over n squared. Uh, the minus one over n squares would cancel. Um, so I can flip A 
That's times two times five. So that goes to 10. It's e to the 10 is the answer there. So that was the answer to the, uh, one of the bonus problems on the test. And that is uh, L'Hopital's rule. So it's a cool technique. So, so now, uh, is one of the special techniques for limits that we know. Uh, to be applied in step three of our limit procedure. Um, if you notice what you have gives an gives a convenient indeterminate form. Perhaps after some calculations. I don't know if I put that in green. All right, so that's L'Hopital's rule. Uh, something that we can talk about now because we have uh, derivatives under our belts. And uh, we have this little trick of uh, e to the ln, uh, things of how to deal with powers um, and do calculus at the same time. So yeah, that's nice. It's another technique called L'Hopital's rule. Um, what do I want to talk about next? I'm gonna move on to a different topic. I don't remember where. It's in chapter two somewhere. Or did we already exit chapter two? Oh, this is actually in chapter six, but I did it before finishing chapter two. So we went up to uh, 2.6 and then I jumped to chapter six and then I jumped back to 2.8 and 2.9. We're skipping 2.7. So this is actually 6.1. Want to talk about derivative of inverse functions? I just figured once I get into the mode of just teaching you derivative techniques and formulas and how to differentiate different kinds of things. I just wanted to stay in that mode and just like focus on that before we go back to the other stuff instead of like, oh, here's a technique for derivatives. Now let's do an application. Now here's a technique for derivatives. Now let's do an application. Now here's a technique for derivatives. Now let's do an application. I'd rather just cure all the techniques for derivatives. Here are all the applications. You can just, it, I, I, I personally, I think it flows better. Um, so yeah, I wanna get all of our derivative techniques out of the way so that Later on, when I, we move to applications, 
which should be next class, I think. Um, so when we move on to applications, we'll just be doing applications um, and we won't have to worry about any new techniques. So once I finish this section on just us learning how to differentiate new things, differentiate in different uh, scenarios, um, then we, we will know our derivatives and we just move on to thinking about something else. Um, so I wanna do derivatives of inverse functions. Um, so now, um, uh, we'll assume you know the basics about inverse functions. Um, important for us. Uh, is the fact that if f of x and g of x are inverses of each other, then um, if you take f of g of x, you would always get x. Um, for all x in the domain of g. And if you take g of f of x, you would get x for all x in the domain of f, right? So inverse functions under, undo each other. This is how we knew that exponentials and logarithms were inverse functions. Because so if I take E, uh, a to log to the base a of x, I just get back the x. And if I take log to the base a of a to the x, I just get back x. Um, it was this property that kind of indicated to us, oh, oh, logs and exponentials must be inverses of each other. And so we can use one to kind of undo the other, to cancel the other one. Um, uh, also, um, we often, denote the inverse uh, function of a function f of x by f to the minus one of x, just written like that. Um, which causes a lot of confusion on some things like uh, trig functions, but we'll talk about alternative notations later, but this is a very common notation um, for the inverse function. Um, so uh, we can say that f of f inverse of x is equal to x. And f inverse of f of x is equal to x. Okay. So that's just using a common property that hopefully you remember. I think there's one other thing I wanna tell you about inverses, uh, but I think it's actually also just a notational thing. Uh, because I'm going to be doing that maneuver later. And I want to make sure that you get it. Well, yeah, well, that's... Um... So uh, if, uh, suppose f is invertible, if f of x has an inverse it is called invertible now suppose f of x is invertible then 
then if f inverse of x if f inverse of let's just make it oh, y equals x this means that uh, y is equal to f of x and the reason is um, if you have like f inverse of y equals x what you can do is you can put both inside of f on both sides and then the inverse will cancel that function and so over here you would just get the y and you can get that um, and it goes both ways so if you have f of x equals y it actually means that y is equal to f inverse of x um, and so on and so forth uh, but i think this is the one that we're going to want to use so Uh, now on to our goal. We want to know how to differentiate inverse functions. That's the that's the point. i.e. Uh, we want to be able to compute something like d dx of f inverse of x, right? So not the derivative of a function, but we want to be able to find the derivative of an inverse function. Um, so for example, um, I know the derivative of the sine function. I know the derivative of sine x. What is the derivative of sine inverse, right? Uh, it's another very important function. I know the derivative of tangent of x. What is the derivative of tan inverse, right? These are very important functions that we'd want to know how to find the derivative. What would it, what procedure would I actually do? Um, and so here's a procedure. We're actually going to use these facts that I reminded you about up here. Um, uh, and now, uh, recall, or since, recall, I just, I literally just reminded you, uh, f of f inverse of x is equal to x for all x in the domain of the inverse. So what I can actually do here is I can actually differentiate uh, both sides. So okay. Um, now, on the left side, I have one function plugged into another one, which means I need to apply the chain rule. Right, so by the chain rule, uh, the derivative of the left side is going to be the derivative of the outer function, leave the inner function alone, then multiply by the derivative of the inner function. On the right side, of course you get one. Now this is what we want. So in other words, I can now solve for the derivative of the inverse. Uh, that's going to be one over f prime of f inverse, right? So this is not f of f inverse, so I can't cancel anything here, but it's one over f prime of f inverse. So I, I can't really treat that as x. Um, so uh, that leads to the formula. Uh, the derivative of an inverse function is one over f prime 
evaluate it at the output of the inverse function whenever it exists. So if the derivative of your inverse function exists, this is the formula that's going to get, get you the answer. Um, so let's actually do some examples. Uh, compute uh, y prime equals dy dx for the following. A y equals uh, sine inverse of x, or we might call that arc sine of x. Uh, because a lot of students are conditioned to think that, oh, the minus one power is just means one over, which it does, but it, it only means one over if it's over here. Like that's correct. Um, but uh, sine with the inverse on the sine, it's not the same as that. Um, so. So to avoid the confusion, um, uh, we sometimes give it a different name called the arc sign. So I wanted to find the derivative of that. I want to find the derivative of tan inverse, arc tangent. I also want, well, um, I think I want this as a separate thing. Um, suppose um, f of x equals x to the fifth minus x cubed plus uh, Uh, plus 2x, find uh, the derivative of the inverse function, evaluated at the point two. Um, so that's gonna be another example, but once some more computational ones. Ugh. So C, I think I wrote them down here. Y equals sine inverse of one minus X squared D Y equals four arc 10 of three X to the fourth D Y equals X squared plus one sine inverse of 4x, f, sine inverse of x plus y equals, oh no, uh, plus y equals x squared. So that's an implicit uh, definition there. So these are the two examples I want to do. Um, which we're not going to get through all of this by the, uh, the end of class. Um, but maybe I can show you the first two. So the first two, it's not just, it's not really an example I would ex expect, I would actually give you. Um, because it turns out the derivative of sine inverse and tan inverse, I actually want you guys to memorize. So this just, these two first examples just serves as an example for me to derive these formulas for you that I'm going to expect you to memorize. And then we can, uh, 
get to the other ones. Um, I think those are all the... Uh, Yeah, those are all the examples I want. Okay, uh, so let's actually do that. Um, this is example one. This is example two. Okay. One a y equals sine inverse of x. which is the same as arcsin. Uh, here's how we will do it. So um, uh, set um, Because I want to use that one. set uh, f of x equals to sine x. Uh, we want uh, the derivative of the inverse. And so this would mean um, the derivative of the inverse function is going to be 1 over f prime evaluated at the inverse function. Now, if f is sine of x, uh, of course, this means that f prime would be cosine of x. Right? So this means that f prime equals cosine of x. So what we have here is 1 over cosine of sine inverse of x. And that might uh, at first be a little bit tricky to do. But uh, something like this, you would have done in pre-calculus, I would think. Um, so what we can do is we can go back way, way back to pre-calculus. Okay, so let's say I wanted to compute cosine of sine inverse of x. Uh, one way we can do this is we can set sine inverse of x to be equal to some angle. Um, so this means by the property we had above, that sine of theta must be x. Um, but this is the same as x over 1. So we can get that uh, triangle here. We know uh, by Sokatoa, Sokatoa. Sine is opposite over our hypotenuse. So this would be 1. That would be x. Here, you would have the square root of x squared minus 1. Um, that would follow by Pythagoras. And so now you can actually compute uh, what this guy is. So this would mean that the cosine, the cosine of sine inverse of x well, that's the same as cosine of theta because theta is the sine inverse. But cosine of theta by Sokotoa of that triangle, it's adjacent over our hypotenuse. I labeled these wrong. Opposite over hypotenuse, one minus x squared. Um, so now, uh, this would be adjacent over hypotenuse. Right? Um, because this guy was uh, opposite over hypotenuse. So uh, yeah, it turns out you can write uh, the cosine of sine in of sine inverse uh, without any trig functions. It's actually the square root of one minus x squared. Um, all right, so now that is what we're going to put here. 
Um, so yeah, this is one over the square root of one minus x squared. And so that uh, gives you a formula. The derivative of sine inverse of x is one over the square root of one minus x squared. And that is just something that we know now. And of course, we know the domain of sine inverse is between uh, minus one and one. So this works for x is uh, strictly between minus one and one. Um, yeah, but uh, uh, this is a formula we know now. Uh, you could even, uh, as always, memorize the chain rule version. Um, the derivative of sine inverse of u is u prime over the radical of one minus u squared. So that's, uh, yeah, that's another, that's the formula we know now. Um, We can do a similar trick to find the derivative of tangent. Uh, so set f of x equals tangent of x. We want the derivative of the inverse function, which is the derivative of tan inverse. So this is going to be by the above formula. Uh, the derivative of the inverse function is one over f prime evaluated at the inverse function. So um, if f of x equals tangent of x, we know what the derivative of tangent is, f prime is equal to secant squared. So this will be uh, one over secant squared of tan inverse. Or in other words, this is one over secant of tan inverse of x squared. Uh, you could even square the denominator. Let's just square the denominator. I think that would be nicer probably. Doesn't matter, it's gonna be the same thing. And now you, you play the same the same trick. Uh, so you go so you go here and you're like, okay, uh, we want a secant of tan inverse, set tan inverse equals theta. This means that uh, x equals tan theta. This means that uh, x over one equals tan theta. And tangent we know is opposite over adjacent. Um, so that means we can create a right triangle. Opposite is x, adjacent is one. So this is going to be the square root of one plus x squared by Pythagoras. And so now uh, the secant of tan inverse, this is the same as the secant of theta. This is the same as uh, hypotenuse over adjacent because secant is one over cosine. So that's going to be one plus X squared. And go back plug it in. And so this is going to be, well, one over one plus X squared. So that's, uh, that's, what, that's the formula we know now, the derivative 
of 10 inverse of x is one over one plus x squared. Which you can, you can memorize that. Um, memorize one of them, but you should know how to apply the chain rule. I'd, I'd recommend you memorize the chain rule version. So yes, memorize this. Or you can memorize the chain rule version. Uh, which is to say the derivative of tan inverse of u is u prime over one plus e squared. All right, so these are just like formulas we know now. Um, so I only expect you to know these two in uh, inverse trig derivatives. Um, so let me put that in different colors so you can see. Um, however, I can mention some of the other ones, but you don't need to know them. Uh, the derivative of cosine inverse, it's actually super close to uh, the sine. It's actually just negative. And again, it only works for x strictly between zero and one. I can talk about the derivative of the cotangent inverse. And that looks like the negative of the tangent, um, arc tangent. So as you can see, it's like, uh, if you know one, we're just gonna assume you know how to deal with the other one. Uh, the derivative of like the secant inverse, that's kind of annoying. That's going to be one over the absolute value of X times the radical of X squared minus one. And the cosecant is actually the negative of that. And for these two, it works outside of the range that I just mentioned. Um, Um, where are we? X is not in minus one to one. Because other, otherwise you have like a, a negative under the square root. Um, yeah. Um, don't need to know these. Don't need to, don't need to memorize. wasn't much better. Um, yeah, so try the rest. Um, So try these for next time. Uh, we'll pick up those and get through them. Uh, what else? 
do I want to do? Yeah, and I think after this, we're done with all the derivative techniques I want to do with you guys. So after we do this, we're going to start some application stuff. Um, I don't know which application we should do first. Probably nicer to do the other one first. Uh, officially in, in line, we have uh, related rates to do, um, but I might do linear approximation first. I think I can get through that quicker. I can probably get through that tomorrow. As opposed to starting related rates, it'll probably break up and go into the next class. Um, yeah, so we will stop there. Thank you for your time and attention. Today, we looked at uh, how to do derivatives of some oddly looking things using the logarithm to help us. We learned about log differentiation as well as the alternative to log differentiation, which is just rewriting things with exponentials. We looked at uh, indeterminate forms and L'Hopital's rule, where the skills we learned earlier in the day helps us there. Um, so now we have a new limit technique that we can use that involves derivatives. And we now know how to take derivatives of inverse functions. That's the formula. Uh, and we use that to derive sine inverse and tan inverse. And then doing the rest of these should be um, straightforward, hopefully, because now you know the formulas. It's just a matter of applying your derivative techniques to it. And then we'll look at this one, which is kind of weird, but it's actually a very common problem type in this section. So you can try, uh, try the rest for next time. Until then, uh, it is late. I'm going to let you guys go. Thank you for your time and attention. Have a good night. And uh, as I mentioned, I won't, don't expect your test being graded before this weekend. Um, yeah, uh, without further ado, that is it. I will uh, have a good night and see you guys in the next one. Ciao.